What's in a name? Potentially a great deal. University of Toronto psychology professor Jordan Peterson has a fight on his hands after objecting to proposed legislation that he says would violate his freedom of speech by forcing him to address transgendered people using the pronouns of their choosing. Joining us now to better understand the issue and debate what's at stake. In Vancouver, British Columbia, Theron Meyer, transgender pundit and YouTuber. In the nation's capital, Kyle Kirkup, professor of law at the University of Ottawa. And here in studio, the aforementioned Jordan Peterson, professor of psychology, University of Toronto, Nicholas Matt, lecturer, transgender studies at U of T, and Mary Rogan, whose article entitled Growing Up Trans is featured in the October issue of The Walrus Magazine. Good to have you three here and our two friends in Points Beyond. We appreciate everybody being on the program for what is, I think, one of the hottest topics in the country today, Professor Peterson, and it's all because of you. And I think before we go any further with our conversation here, I want to give people a sense of how hot this has got, uh, starting on the downtown campus of the University of Toronto. Sheldon, if you would, roll it. Okay. Well, as you can see, the opponents of free speech are capable of making a lot of inarticulate noise. Free speech! is the mechanism by which we keep our society functioning. Woo! And by doing this, you're imposing, you're imposing. Whoa, 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 I'm going to post okay. this online That's that you would fine. like people okay. to not to be to be more accommodating of trans people and people of color at your events in future. I would I'm like a person there of to color. be no Listen, violence. I'm a person of color and I felt very accommodated. Here. There have been multiple, multiple recorded instances of trans people killing themselves Straight because men, because, because they are because they are not right being right integrated right into society. If it wasn't for this law and I asked you to refer to me with they them pronouns, would you? Why do you have the authority to determine whether or not an individual is worthy of you? using their pronouns. Like if I asked you, would you please use they them pronouns for me? What, what? It would depend on what, what I thought of your motivation. What do you want us to jump for? Those what are my pronouns. Okay, with um, indulgence of everybody else on the program, I'm gonna start with Professor Peterson off the top here for a while because as I suggested, you thought long and hard about this. You posted uh, a few things up to YouTube uh, because you had been thinking long and hard about it. One and a half million hits later, Jordan, one and a half million hits later, this has become a huge issue. So let's start there. Why did you post those views to YouTube in the first place? Well, there's proximate and distal reasons. The proximate reasons was because I received some correspondence from, from, uh, from clients of mine who had been, um, I would say, persecuted in a variety of ways by people who were politically correct and they sent me some documentation about Bill C-16 and the associated policy statements on the Ontario Human Rights Commission which I read and was not very happy about um, and also because the University of Toronto decided to make anti-racism and anti-bias training so-called anti-racism and anti-bias training mandatory which I regarded as an inappropriate incursion into the domain of political opinion by the university administration. Have you taken that training yet? No, and I don't have to yet. It's, it's the HR department personnel that have to take it. If they decide that you have to, will you? No way. Not a chance. Okay. And what's the other, you referred to persecution that friends or clients of yours had experienced, such yeah, as? Yeah, well, um, there are lots of places now where the workplace has become, I would say, excessively politicized, and so people who have viewpoints, and this also involves, includes, I would say, fairly radical leftist viewpoints, people don't feel comfortable at all in, in, in being able to use the language of their choice or to have even opinions about a variety of different things. And so, um, and I've had three clients who, I would say, have been, we'll say, Harassed, I suppose, is the right way of putting it. On social um, media or otherwise? No, at work, at work, at work, at work, by people who who don't like their political opinions, essentially. And the opinions were so, what? Um, well, I can't tell you too much about it, actually, because because of issues, fundamental right. issues of confidentiality. Give a, but, give, give a, essentially, uh, I guess what I'm asking is to lay the case out. What, well, what is it you find offensive about this legislation? Well, fundamentally, there, there were two things that really bothered me, although th there have been other things I've thought about since. One was that I was being 
asked, as everyone is, to use a certain set of words that I think are the constructions of people who have a political ideology that I don't believe in and that I also regard as, as dangerous. What are those words? Those are the made up words to re that, that people now describe as, um, as gender neutral. And so, to me, they're, 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 they're an attempt to control language and, and in a direction that isn't happening organically. It's not happening naturally. People aren't picking up these words in the typical way that new words are picked up, but by force and by fiat. And I would say by force because there's legislative power behind them. So and I don't so like I these made up words, Z and Zer and that sort of okay, thing. Okay, what about, they're not all made up words, quote unquote made yeah. up words. For example, uh, they is one of them. Yeah, to, but we, to speak to an individual yes, as they. Right, but we can't dispense with the distinction between singular and plural. I mean, I know that the advocates of that particular approach say that they has been used forever as a singular, and that's actually not correct. It's used as a singular in very exceptional circumstances, like if your child wishes to bring a book to school, they're welcome to do so. But That's just grammatically is, incorrect. Well, it is also, there's some debate about that because it is, they is used like that sometimes. But it's never been used as a singular replacement for he or she. And right. so it's not, it's not a tenable solution. And that's the best of the solutions. So we understand your views and where you're coming from. Uh, you decided to lay these views out in some mm -hmm. YouTube uh, discourses. Yes. You put them up. The response has been overwhelming. Did you yes. anticipate that you would get this kind of feedback? No, there was no way of anticipating this. And I think you mentioned in the intro, you know, that this is a consequence of what I've done. And I don't think that's true. It's a, it's a consequence of the fact. I, I thought about it, and I think the right metaphor is that, you know, there's a large forest, and it's been a hot, dry summer, or maybe a drought, and there's plenty of deadwood gathered. And I lit a spark. And you can't blame the forest fire on the spark. And, uh, you know, it's just not possible for someone to put up a YouTube video and cause this kind of brouhaha without all of the groundwork well, already being laid. Fair enough. There, there, there is clearly an... Ap uh, there, there is out there an appetite against political correctness, which is what you have described this as. In fact, your YouTube video is called Professor Against Political Correctness. Mm -hmm. But let's make sure we're all speaking the same language here. You would define that how? Political well, correctness. Well, I think it's a particular kind of ideological game, and I, I think the outcome is twofold. It's to make the player feel morally superior and also to take um, rather serious uh, axe swings at the foundation of society. And so the game is identify a domain of human endeavor, note that there's a distribution of success. Some people are doing comparatively better and some people are doing comparatively worse. Define those doing worse as victims. Define those doing better as perpetrators. Identify with the victims, have yourself a, a set of enemies handy to vent your resentment on, feel good about it even though it didn't really require any work on your part, and then endlessly repeat. And that's why I've seen that happening on campuses in particular for the last 30 years. In your YouTube talk, you describe those who oppose you on this issue as, quote, resentful and uninformed. Yes. Tell me why you think that's accurate. Well, um, I worked for the NDP when I was a kid. Eh? from the time I was 14 to the time I was 18, I worked with Rachel Notley's father and, and her mother and, and knew them very well. And I actually found them very admirable people as well as the other people in the, on the socialist end of the distribution who were genuinely working for, for the rights of working class people, coming out of that Saskatchewan tradition that established health care and pension and all of that. But I noted at the same time that the party functionaries, let's say, weren't that sort of person at all. They didn't really like the working class. They weren't standing up for them. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it until I read George Orwell's Road to Wigan Pier, which is a brilliant book, and which was written for the Left Book Club in the UK. And he was talking about the failures of socialism in, in, in the United Kingdom and, and then discussed intellectual socialists of the type who didn't exactly like the poor. Okay. They just hated the rich. Resentful and uninformed, though. Yes. Well, the resentful part is is the is the willingness to pull down any structure that's hierarchical because of resentment about not being on the top, and uninformed is well, it's the it's the con consistent attempt to force every political issue into a single in, into the domain encompassed and viewed through this single lens. Jordan, so, let's do one more question here, and then we'll get everybody else into the conversation. You know, of course, that since this story broke, you've been called a lot of things. Yeah. Um, one of which is a transphobe. Yeah. Some people have accused you of um, using the free speech issue to mask what's really going on here, which is an attempt to deprive other people of what they believe are their 
legitimate rights. Well, and I, I want to give you the opportunity to speak to whether or not you are a transphobe. Well, I can tell you that I've received more letters from transsexual people supporting me than opposing me. And I never said anything, really, about transsexual people, about their existence, although that was the first thing that I was accused of doing. I didn't say that transsexual people didn't exist. I said that gender identity, gender expression, and biological sex do not vary independently, which they don't. And so oh, this issue is, in some sense, only peripherally about, about transsexual issues. It's more centrally about gender issues. And then on top of that, and I think it's the biggest issue, is, is that it's a free speech issue. Okay. So. Let us continue to explore all of those issues that you have just raised. And um, why don't we do this? Let's take a moment. We're going to explain a few basic things here. The issue of so-called non-traditional pronouns goes together with non-traditional gender identities. New York City, for example, recognizes 31 such gender expressions. In other words, besides man and woman, there are 29 other gender expressions. For example, pangender, queer gender, gender fluid, cross-dresser, bi-gendered, gender blender, and the list goes on. And Nicholas, this is where I want to bring you into the discussion because you teach this. You mm -hmm. teach trans studies. So if you would, give us a brief primer on so many gender identities that in your view require non-traditional pronouns. Basically, it's not correct that there is such a thing as biological sex. And I'm a historian of medicine. I can unpack that for you at great length if you want. But in the interest of time, uh, I won't. So that's a very popular misconception. So essentially, when in my transgender studies classes, what we're doing is looking at actual research and identifying ways that current social issues related to trans people or things that are associated with trans, such as free speech arguments and claims, uh, how that connects to the way that people are thinking, the way that research has been framed, the history is Give us systemic. some of the other pronouns that one would hear, typically. Um, I don't focus on pronouns because pronouns are actually part of a cisnormative culture. So what we do is learn about... Well, I'm going to stop you right there. Yes, yeah, I was just about to explain. Good. So we don't start from a cisnormative perspective because that can't actually go very far. What does cisnormative mean? So I'm going to start us there. Cisnormative is basically the very popular idea and assumption that most people probably have, and definitely that our structures convey, uh, that there is such a thing as male and female, that they connect to being a girl or a boy or a man or a woman. Uh, and then sometimes that will also recognize intersex or trans people or transsexual people, as you mentioned, uh, because that's uh, sometimes also referred to as a gender binary. So anything that fits within a gender binary uh, can work within cisnormativity. Okay. Uh, but cisnormativity is basically that everyone assumes that there is male and female, and so very little is actually looked at to understand what's actually the case. And scientists yeah. have been doing this for because at your least view over would be 50 years. Your view would be it's much more complicated than that. Right. It's not my view. I just know that for over 50 years, scientists have shown that that's not true. And yet, our social systems haven't been able to find a way to address the level of complexity that what people point, actually can I, experience. Can I step in, Steve? St stand by for a second, because okay. I want to let everybody else get in mm -hmm. first, and, and then, I then we'll get you in. You either, so. Mary, how prevalent is transgenderism in our world? I don't think I can. I, I don't think I can answer that question. I think that um, I would agree with Nicholas that there is some discrepancy on on these numbers, and there is some variance on the numbers. Um, I guess. Uh, I guess I'm curious as to why we need a, we need to put a number on on this because that's come up. By, I, I listened uh, to um, Jordan's uh, video. Um, and that was something that was mentioned. You know, this is um, statistically, you know, there are so few intersex people as to be, it's insignificant. Um, well, I think there's a reasonable curiosity as to whether or not we're talking about half the population or less than 1% of the population. That's uh, all. No, I, I understand that. I, I guess what I'm saying is um, it seems that there's a focus on that in terms of what we know now. And I think what Nicholas is trying to trying to say, and I don't, I don't want to presume too much, um, I think that that number is going to be something that evolves as we evolve and our language evolves and we give people the room to come forward and express who they are. Okay, let me, as part of that expression and evolution of, of this issue, the use of non-traditional pronouns. Where are you on that? I, I think people should be able to say how they want to be addressed. I do believe that. Um, in my own experience in writing the Walrus piece, you know, I began at one place and ended at another. Um, and I'll let everyone pay their seven dollars to find out how <laughs> they can buy the magazine but but I think that for me you know identifying as male at a, a very late stage in my life 
Um, I don't have, I didn't have a lot of attachment to the pronoun she. You, you could have said giraffe. I had found a way at a very early age not to even hear that word. It, it meant nothing to me. Um, so I didn't dive into the pronoun he. Um, so if I were going to refer to you, though, in the they, third person, you they. would want me to call you they? Yes. Okay. Because that encapsulates what? I think it reflects where I am right now. I, 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 because of my lived experience, you know, five decades as, as being identified, um, certainly by the world, as female, some of the time, not all of the time, um, my lived experience was largely female. Um, and I personally am not sort of ready to jump in wholly into having people call me he, but I'm certainly far enough along in terms of you know, how I feel internally that I don't want to be called she. Understood. Let's go to British Columbia. Uh, Theron, I want you to help us understand for our viewers who don't know you and don't know your work, I would like you to describe yourself. Um, well, I, I make political commentary on, mostly on YouTube. And uh, I mostly focus on um, basically countering with my own personal uh, perspectives, uh, countering what I consider to be uh, the kind of hegemony uh, surrounding, the political hegemony surrounding trans politics and, um, and what I consider to be uh, quite ridiculous uh, um, opinions and demands coming from what has come to be known as the kind of the political trans lobby. I'm not as good at this issue as I should be, so I'm going to look to you to help me make the right, use the right words here to describe how you were born and what you see yourself as now. So is it accurate to say you're a trans woman? Yes, I'm, a, I'm Oh, I wish I lived in a world where that was just obvious and I don't have to explain that to people, but apparently I do. Um, I mean, yes, I'm just a woman. Does this, is um, this to say you were, you were born male but now are female? Yes, I transition from male to female. Um, in which case, and, do, uh, I, yeah. do I refer to you, I, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Mary, which is, do I refer to you as her or she now? Yes, you do. I do, okay. And how do you relate to the experiences that we have heard arise during this debate where gender identities and pronouns are um, up for grabs, if you like? Uh, I uh, am very skeptical of um, the ideology surrounding uh, gender identity. I don't believe there are 29 plus gender identities or genders. Um, I believe there's male and female, and then there's somewhere in between, and, and most people fall along that. Um, and just people who are in between does not constitute a new gender. There are two genders, period. Uh, and that is uh, biologically a, a sound argument to make, just because, uh, because the argument that, that, uh, that was early, made earlier in the show is that, or it wasn't an argument, but a claim, that uh, there is no such thing as biological sex. Well, that's simply not true. It is true that there are multiple uh, characteristics and there are multiple factors that go into determining sex and that sex is not an on-off switch, that there is a spectrum to it, just like with most thing in things in nature. Uh, most things aren't an on-off switch. Most things develop uh, like on a spectrum. Um, but for the most part, uh, the vast majority of people fall either on the male side or on the female side. Um, and yes, it's true that, that scientists, that, that, that doctors have and researchers have um, been finding more and more factors that go into um, not only determining genetic sex, but determining um, the expression of those genes. Um, so it's truly a fascinating, complex um, uh, field of study, but that does not mean that there is no such thing as biological sex. Uh, okay. When it comes to the, pro the issue of pronouns, uh, would you like me to? Yeah, uh, give briefly, my on briefly, that? if you would, because Kyle has been the most patient person in the world, waiting for his chance to get in. So yes, you finish your statement, and then I'm going to get to Kyle. Okay, my apologies. Uh, well, firstly, I have a lot of sympathy for people who want to be referred to by their pronouns. Um, obviously, as a trans woman. Uh, I, I know what it feels like to be mis mis um, misgendered and whatnot. Uh, 
And most people are reasonable in the sense that they would, uh, would be reasonable enough to accommodate uh, trans people and, and their, uh, their preferred pronouns. Um, and I'm sure, I mean, I would hope that if I were a, a student of Dr. Peterson, that he would refer to me as, uh, um, as she and wouldn't have a problem with that. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, a personal pronoun preference still is a preference for what language other people use. And at the end of the day, I don't uh, have ultimate control of, over what Dr. Peterson, uh, what the language he chooses to use, or anybody else for that matters. That's, that's up to them. Okay, let me and find the out then. Arises let, me, let me find out. If she were a student of yours, what would you call her? She. You would. Okay. We've established that. Um, Theron, stand by for a second now. I do want uh, <laughs> thank you for your patience, uh, Professor Kirkup, and I want to bring you in now because, uh, as I suggested earlier, in New York City, they have identified 31 gender identities, and apparently the law down there suggests that if businesses don't accommodate an individual's chosen gender identity, there is the risk of a six-figure fine under the, rule, uh, the rules rather, of the city's Commissioner of Human Rights. We have, in the province of Ontario, our own Ontario Human Rights Commission, and I wonder how similar our legislation is here on this issue compared to what they have in New York City. So where I would start the discussion is to actually point that, you know, even though we're talking about uh, adding gender identity and gender expression to the Canadian Human Rights Act, um, and provisions of the criminal code. This is a long-standing practice in Canadian human rights uh, jurisprudence. You can go back into the late 1990s. Um, and the cases that we're seeing in the tribunals are not the kind of uh, extreme examples of, of a number of different kinds of gender pronouns. What we're seeing is really more basic um, human rights questions. So questions like, um, are you required to undergo surgery in order to have an identity document that uh, properly captures who you are as a person, uh, discrimination in policing contexts, um, discrimination in the workplace. And so I think um, the pronoun issue is really a red herring. When you look through the jurisprudence dating back to the 1990s, we're seeing much more fundamental questions, really basic human rights questions that are coming before the tribunals. And uh, I, having reviewed the, the case law, um, I'm not seeing the kind of New York scenario that, that you're proposing at all. Well, let me read some of the Ontario Human Rights Code to you, and then I'll get your feedback on that. Discrimination, the Human Rights Code says, happens when a person experiences negative treatment or impact, intentional or not, because of their gender identity or gender expression. It can be direct and obvious or subtle and hidden, but harmful just the same. It can also happen on a bigger systemic level, such as organizational rules or policies that look neutral but end up excluding trans people. Organizations are liable for any discrimination and harassment that happens. They are also liable for not accommodating a trans person's needs unless it would cause undue hardship. And again, Kyle, I'll get you to follow up on that in as much as if a trans person uh, or somebody whose gender identity was more, shall we say, complicated than the male-female that we've been talking about so far, and the pronoun used to describe that person were not traditional, would the person have a case before the Human Rights Commission? So we haven't seen cases on that at this point, but I would say absolutely as a rule of, uh, as a general rule that you should be thinking about in terms of employment settings, uh, absolutely respecting uh, trans persons, pronoun choice is really fundamental. Um, and I can also say that in lots of circumstances, uh, a pronoun may not even be required. There are lots of creative ways uh, to avoid using uh, gender pronouns at all. And so I think that, um, but when you actually look at, at the, the cases that are coming before tribunals, uh, we're not seeing that to be really the primary issue. It's much more uh, basic human rights questions, which is what the federal legislation here, Bill C-16, tries to accomplish. All right, I think we've set the table now. You want to get in on this now, I can tell. You've heard what the professor has to say. What's your response? Well, I don't understand what the claim that there's no such thing as biological sex means. And I certainly think it's let's call it an error to suggest that there's some si sort of scientific consensus about that. I mean, there's, there's biological differences between males and females in animals and human beings at every level of analysis. From what, the, okay, I'm jumping in here. Yeah. Because what, what about the notion he put forward at the end there, that if you do not refer to people with the pronoun that they prefer to be referred to, that is a form, according to the Human Rights Commission, of discrimination. It's and not just a form of discrimination. It's a form of hate speech. That's why I made the video. 
I said that we were in danger of, of placing uh, the refusal to use certain kinds of language into the same category as Holocaust denial and suggested that maybe that wasn't such a good idea, especially since there's plenty of debate to be had about gender issues in our society, which I also think are also in danger of becoming illegal and quite rapidly. So it isn't clear to me how long we'll be able to have the talk that we're having right now. Here are can some. I jump in there? Can I can I jump in, can I jump in there on please the book? I think it's a common misconception about Bill C sixteen that is somehow going to make um, pronoun use into hate speech. If you actually look at the provisions, we're talking about very minor amendments to the criminal code. Um, for They're example, not minor. Section, they uh, put it into the hate speech category. They're not minor at all. That's I a misstatement. Agree with you on that point, I think. So don't tell me they're minor. Here. That's not. That's not there's right. There's a lot of opportunity. So section. Opening. Kyle, yeah, so ahead. section 318, pardon me, uh, so section 318 sets out uh, a series of identifiable groups and we're talking about the clearest of, of cases, the cases of uh, advocating genocide. Uh, and we have a series of groups that are already identified in the code and all this does is add gender identity and gender expression to the categories that are already identified. And so I think we really have to add some um, reasonableness to this discussion, actually clearly articulate what the provision does. Well, let me be a little clear about what some of the problems, um, what you might be asking for if you want to do this. For example, and uh, Sheldon, bottom of page three here, let's put this graphic up. Pronoun misuse may become actionable through the human rights tribunals and the courts, and the remedies monetary damages, non-financial remedies, for example, ceasing the discriminatory practice or reinstatement to the job, and public interest remedies, for example, changing hiring practices or developing non-discriminatory policies and procedures, jail time is not one of them. Jordan, you're not going to go to jail if you keep this up. Are you, do you find that uh, reassuring? What if I don't pay the fine? Then what? Then what? And let, let's talk about the legalities for a minute. As you know, the University of Toronto sent me two warning letters, right? And the second one basically asked me to stop talking about this. Who and, sent the letters? Uh, the first, it's the administration, fundamentally, the higher up people in the administration. The last one was the dean of, of uh, the Faculty of Arts and Science. Um, but, you know, it's, it's coming from the top end of the university. And the letters said essentially you, you must call people by the pronouns they want? They, the letters basically said that, um, and this is paraphrasing obviously, mm -hmm. that as I'm required to abide by the university policies and the Ontario Human Rights Code and, and it, there's a strong implication in the letter by having this discussion that I wasn't doing so and so they're asking me to stop and I can tell you also why they're asking me to stop apart from that. The, the codes as written make the university just as liable for my speech as I am. So not, not only is there a reasonable possibility that what I'm doing is uttering hate speech now under our law but the university is um, legally responsible for that and so I think they consulted with their lawyers and decided that maybe the claim that I was making in my video was correct. That so, and so I don't regard that as trivial, and I think that the, the lawyer who's discussing this is downplaying the significance of it tremendously. Could I speak to the campus climate about this? Because I don't, uh, I don't agree with why Dr. Peterson has been asked to stop abusing students on campus. To stop doing what? Abusing students. I see. And other members of our learning community who do deserve respect and do deserve to be able to work and learn and contribute to society in a place where if they are physically assaulted, if they are... Um, the assault so far came from the social justice warriors who are at this free speech rally and almost two million people have watched those accurate. so far. This is not accurate. Well, you can you look at the videos yourself. Because people have been making complaints about your behavior. Yes, I understand that. Yes. That, and so we're seeing just a greater opportunity here, for social justice happening Nick, that many be, people won't understand. Nick, can I be clear on something? You, you've accused him of abusing students by not using the pronouns they want to be addressed That's by. That's how I see it, absolutely. That is tantamount to abuse in your view. Absolutely. Many, many global documents, many how organizations. About violence? Is it tantamount to violence? Yes, How about absolutely. hate speech? Is it tantamount to yes, hate speech? Yes, of course. It's hate speech Fine, to tell someone that you won't refer to them as a in a way that they uh, that recognizes their humanity and dignity. Mary, let me get you in on this at this point. Sure. Um, <laughs> you got something you want to say, or can I can I put a question to you? Um, both. Go ahead. Okay. For the, for the question. At you're all. a writer, Mary. I am. I know you care about free speech because you're a writer. Yes. Does does Jordan Peterson have a little place in your heart because he's arguing free speech here? I think the interesting thing about about Jordan and how I feel about his video and and Jordan and I actually had an opportunity to talk at length before I wrote the Walrus article um, 
And he sails really close to things that I think people can relate to. And I think that we all want to have you know, an open discourse. We want conversations to unfold. We want people to feel like they, ha if they have something to say, if they have a question, they can ask it, that they're not going to be censored. But he sails really close and then right past it. And that's where, where he and I part ways. Because what I don't really understand is uh, when you listen to, to, to the video, he piles a lot of things into the basket of using the pronouns that people want. And it seems to me, and you can, you can correct me uh, if I'm wrong, um, but one of his anxieties, and he talks about being fearful and, and anxious in, in his video, um, that somehow there's a cabal of trans activists who have so much power that they are going to basically, you know, using, using the pronouns that people want and capitulating to these demands sort of pulls out the Jenga, you know, the critical Jenga piece of the Western canon, right? I mean, basically, Jordan is arguing that this is going to create chaos and anarchy and that it's, that it's essentially a Marxist plot um, uh, that um, is there to sow violence and there to sow confusion um, and topple any kind of hierarchy. Can I just jump in there for a second? Is that an accurate characterization of your view on really this? I listened really closely to that tape. Okay. I think it is. Is it? In your view, has she accurately characterized where you're coming from? Um, there, it's not a transsexual cabal by any stretch of the imagination. Mm -hmm. um, is it a cabal of radical left-wingers? Yes, it's a cabal of radical left-wingers. And they've been active behind and in front of the scenes in increasingly over the last 30 years. And my estimation is that departments like Women's Studies have trained between 300,000 and 3 million radical left-wing activists. And they're Making... And they're all underpaid, so don't worry. <laughs> well, they could pick higher paying occupations <laughs> if they wanted higher paying occupations, but... Because sexism does not exist. <laughs> Are you kidding let's, me? Let's not get off topic here, but, folks. But, Go I ahead, Mary. I think we're directly Mary. on point. Mary, so, come on so, back. So I think, I think, I think, I think Jordan, it's not I think Jordan has question. conceded that, that I, I think I've grasped his, his concern. At, at the very least, I've grasped the concern mm -hmm. and um, that there is a, a kind of chipping away at order as we, as we come to know it. The other thing that Jordan and I have in common is a real interest in language um, and the idea of um, what can happen when language changes, when it evolves. Um, and you know, I was thinking before I came here, I was thinking about, uh, I grew up in the Bronx and, and um, I was born in 61. So um, I remember very well when we went from, from Mrs. to Ms. And my father was appalled. And he kept saying, Ms. And he thought that was funny, because if you couldn't actually identify somebody as either, uh, particularly a female, as either married or single, then the notion chaos, of, the chaos no, the right? The notion of characterizing a woman independent of her marital That's status right. was controversial and, 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 at the and time. And apparently very, very confusing. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm reminded of that when, 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 there's the, when the suggestion is made that somehow if, if we have words that don't fit into a, a something that we're very familiar with and that we've used to date, that chaos will ensue, that everyone well, will be confused. There's, 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 the I don't believe is, that. There's the, no evidence of that historically. I, I, I hear you, but the, there was no law obliging people to use the word Actually, Ms. But there were laws to oblige, to oblige people to change um, uh, the way that we referred to uh, black people, for example. Um, you know, there was, there was a time when there were any number of words that we now can only say as letters. Um, can I say them on TVO? People were called darkies, niggers, coons, in polite company. And that evolved. Those things changed. When I was a teenager, people were still using those words. Um, so and this is a natural evolution in your this view? This is a natural evolution, and nobody's chaos will not ensue. If it's ensue. a natural and in, evolution, then we don't need hate speech law to enforce it. But, but we obviously we do, situation. because we can drive social change, and it doesn't all have to lead to chaos, is, is my point. And, and I think that you know we have seen the flip side of Jordan's argument, I think, has in fact, we do have a historical record of that. So when it was left to others to name people, we lost indigenous names. I come from my mother's from Ireland. She was from a generation that finally got to learn her own language again. Mm -hmm. She couldn't even speak Gaelic to her parents because they hadn't been allowed to speak it. So we know we've seen the effect when people can't use their own language, when they can't use their own names. Okay, and, and let me get Jordan to respond to that. A natural evolution of things, Jordan. That's it, how it's look, being described. Words are tools. Um, maybe that was one of the great philosophical discoveries of the 20th century. And, and that means 
and people are always looking for new tools to operate in the world. And if you invent a good tool, like a new word, then people will pick it up just as fast as they possibly can. You really see that in English. But the words that are being required now are not good tools, and that's why people aren't using them. And so instead, what we have is the use of force, despite the fact that that's being denied. Um, although we've already established that, at least in the opinion of one of the people on this panel, I'm already guilty of a hate crime, which is what I said I was guilty of when I made that video. We're, Steve, the issue with the law is quite straightforward. The government is responding, is requiring us to use certain language. That's not the same as not using certain language. And it's a line, and this is the fundamental issue. This is maybe the fundamental issue. That's a line we should not cross. We should not allow the government to decide which words we're allowed to use. It's a mistake, and it's a mistake that strikes right at the heart of free speech. And the thing about free speech is that it's not the right to criticize your uh, leaders, which is what people usually characterize it as. Is freedom of speech is freedom to engage in the processes that we use to formulate the problems in our society, to generate solutions to them, and reach a consensus. It's actually a mechanism. It's not just another value. And you should put constraints on free speech with the most extreme caution because you interfere with people's ability to think and communicate. Let me get Theron to weigh in. Theron, you've been hearing the debate here in the studio. Why don't you weigh in and pick it up? Well, I guess I'm in the same boat as Dr. Peterson when it comes to being guilty of a hate crime uh, or, a, sorry, a hate speech uh, infringement because, I mean, I, I draw the line somewhere. For example, <clears throat> I refuse to use pronouns like Z, Zem, Zer. Uh, I don't have a problem using they, them, their pronouns. And that also happens just to me because of the circles in which I move. I happen to know people who use gender neutral pronouns, so I've gotten used to it. But the vast majority of people are not going to come into contact with uh, the incredibly small fraction of the population of gender non-binary people. Uh, and, and that's why this word, this is never really going to pick up, in my opinion, you know, when it comes to Mrs. and Ms. Um, at least at least half of the population uh, is female, so there was uh, some interaction with the term uh, Mrs. versus Ms. Um, and, and, and there were some interactions so people could pick it up. Uh, there just aren't enough gender non-binary, I, I use that in quotation marks because I hate that term because it's a political term, not a, not a gender identity or, or, a, or a term of identification. It's just a political term, but regardless, uh, I, I don't think it's going to pick up. Um, there's just not enough of these people to interact with. The uh, Twitter sphere has been uh, buzzing with this conversation. And um, let's just pull one up here. Let's pull up one tweet. This was tweeted to a number of people, including, as you can see in the middle, Jordan B. Peterson, who's on our program tonight. I so look forward to Bill C-16 putting your kind of silly trolling to an end, it says. There are people, uh, let's, uh, let's go to our uh, Professor uh, Kyle in Ottawa. There are people out there who hope that C-16 lives up to Jordan's worst fears. Do you agree that C-16 ought to be able to prevent people from expressing negative opinions about transgender people? So first I want to clarify that Bill C-16 only applies to federally regulated entities. So for example, the University of Toronto is under provincial jurisdiction, so is therefore subject to the Ontario Human Rights Code. So I think that's an important point to note. I also want to note um, there's been a lot of talk about the ha hate crimes that seems to be like kind of an American import into our discussion. The only two changes that this uh, Bill C-16 make are to uh, make minor amendments to Section 318 and 718 of the Criminal Code. Uh, the first is advocating genocide, as I've talked about, a very, very extreme high standard. And then second off, at sentencing, um, after an offense has been committed and a person has been found guilty, um, what 718 does is it tells judges that they ought to uh, treat hate motivation as an aggravating factor at sentencing to treat that as a more severe form. And the, the, currently we have a, a series of identities that are set out in 718, things like sexual orientation, uh, race. We don't have currently gender identity and gender expression there. And so that's what, uh, what this do. So I, think, I just want to make, make it very clear that we ought not to be importing American concepts into the discussion uh, here. Uh, and so to the extent that Bill C-16 makes changes uh, only to, in the Canadian Human Rights Act context to federally regulated entities, which is not 
the University of Toronto. Nicholas, let me follow up with you. Why, in your view, do you think the trans community needs this kind of legislative protection? Well, thank you. That's basically the point that hasn't been raised yet, which is that people are actually suffering huge lack of access to resources that will allow people to survive. So people are being physically assaulted. People do not have counselors that they can go to who are um, not going to, uh, as Dr. Peterson has done on YouTube, recommend that they actually become more anxious and more um, upset about situations. Uh, people are being assaulted. I brought all sorts of really depressing stats that um, people who are leaning towards thinking that this is not that big of a deal. Those people need to look at those stats. But Give many us people... Give us one stat. Yeah, so 58% um, of students could not get academic transcripts with their correct name or pronoun. That causes a huge chain of events for uh, students or anybody who's had any kind of academic training. As everyone recognizes, we need to be able to have references. We need to be able to have uh, resumes. We need to be able to um, get jobs. So I want to be sure that I'm clear I'm clearly understanding your point here, which is, and therefore they feel disrespected, and therefore this affects their life in a very real way? Is that right? The feeling of disrespect is not as important as the um, ways that people in authority are able to circumvent the possibilities for living. So it has more to do with not being able to find housing and therefore being homeless. It has more to do with not being able to get jobs because people are discriminated against. So we're not actually talking, we shouldn't be talking about free speech. What we should be talking about are the social issues facing people who are being discriminated against and what that looks like on campus, which is that some professors uh, refuse to offer basic dignity to students and colleagues. And that leads to uh, people missing classes. It leads to people dropping out. It leads to a lack of positive um, opportunity for society to actually benefit from the contributions of many, many people. And I also don't teach that there's a huge divide between trans people and non-trans people, because I would say the number is 100% of people will benefit from more open discussion. And one of the problems is that it's being addressed in a black and white way. So it's too bad that we can't actually have an open conversation well, because there's a who, huge wall somebody, of violence between us. Here is somebody who did not share your view on that, because we invited another guest to be on the program today, and this person initially said yes, and then sent a Facebook me message to our producer, Vodak Schemberg, saying, you know what, changed my mind. Giving Jordan Peterson this platform serves to, serves to legitimize his views, which are based in bigotry and misinformation. The humanity and rights of transgender, non-binary, and intersex people are not a matter of debate, and holding a debate, which places a false equivalency between the views expressed by Peterson and the human rights concerns of the trans community would be an act of transphobia. Therefore, none of us wish to participate in this. Okay. Thank why, you. Why are, Thank you for reading that. I, that's a very important that, perspective. That's why I read it. I wonder whether, Jordan, um, everybody's talking past each other here. You are trying to make a point about free speech. The I other don't side. I think we're talking past each well, other. Well, but Steve. the others. You're, you're trying to make a, a point about free speech. The other side is trying to make a point about the rights, the human rights of trans people. That's not the point that you're trying to make. Do we have two different groups here that are trying to make two different points and they find themselves in the same bowl of soup and that's why this has turned into the conflagration it has? Well, it's partly that because the issues we're discussing have to center on some actual issues and they happen to be centering on the, the issue surrounding transgender language. Um, but I don't think we're talking past each other at all in, in a fundamental sense. I mean, I think that, that the real problem here is that there's a concerted attempt made, being made by many people to subvert all values to the value of equality of outcome. And we need more than one value, first of all, if we're going to survive as a society, because you can't solve every problem with the same approach. But there are more insidious things, in my estimation, going on underneath. I mean, even the, the, the uh, missive that you just read said that, well, even providing me with a platform, let's call it, to express my views, is something that shouldn't be allowed. It's like, yes, that's why I made the video. I, it was because many people are claiming that the expression of these sorts of views should no longer be permitted. And it's this view for now, but this is a minor issue in some ways compared to the larger issue that's at stake, which is there are right to have discussions of this sort at all. Like, I mean, one thing that happened right when we started this was that there was an initial claim, for example, that there's no such thing as biological sex. 
Well, I believe quite firmly that if we continue on our present path at the universities for five more years, that's a discussion we will not actually be able to have on campuses. Because, because it will be... by fiat, I mean, the legislation already implicitly presumes that, that biological sex, gender identity, and gender expression, which we haven't even talked about yet, vary independently. That is simply not true. Theron, there... Um... The person who sent that Facebook message thinks that we're partaking in transphobia just by having this debate. I hope that's not the case. But I wonder if you could give us your explanation for why um, some people adamantly refuse even to have this discussion, that the notion of having this discussion is somehow transphobic. Um, I think it has to do with um, there's, a, there's a lacking when it comes to actually be able to being able to defend uh, your your points through argument. So if you open up the discussion for argument, they know they will lose. Um, I think it's absolutely ludicrous and insane to say that having this discussion is by default transphobic. Um, I think it's even more lud it's equally ludicrous to call Dr. Peterson what he said transphobic. Um, I, I I think it, it takes using that term so willy nilly. Uh, it, it takes the emotional response to a term like transphobia and connotates it with something uh, as, as, in my opinion, productive as having an open discussion. And I think that's very insidious and I think that's very manipulative. Kyle, are we um, being transphobic here by having this debate? Well, I do worry about uh, setting up a false equivalency in, in this conversation and really even having making the premise that trans lives are up for debate. They're not up for debate. Human rights aren't up for debate. And the reason that I agreed to be on the program is that I've been very troubled by the misinformation about what the law is actually going to do. Um, and so I really grappled with whether or not I wanted to participate in this discussion. Um, but I thought it was very important to really try to dial back the hateful rhetoric and actually do a very careful uh, discussion about what the law is actually designed to achieve and ultimately to promote a more uh, equitable and just society. So we've talked about uh, freedom of expression, to use the Canadian term, but we should also be talking about other uh, values like equality uh, and anti-racism, I think. Just uh, yeah. curious, Mary, I'm going to get to you one sec. I am curious, though, you've now participated in 90% of the program. We're just about done. Uh, do you, uh, was it a good idea for you to come on? I think that it's an opportunity to try to work through some of the, the legal issues, uh, the social and human rights and equality issues. Uh, and, and so I'm happy to be here, but I recognize that other people's experiences, they might find ultimately that participating in this, this, this program was, was a mistake. Mary, Only you want to follow up? Um, well, I, I certainly, sorry, I, I certainly want to say that I found, Kyle, I found that what you brought to it in terms of putting, putting the bill into perspective actually really helpful and probably helpful to a lot of people. So I'm, I'm glad Thank that you. Kyle was here. I think for me, one of the things that I'm really, I, I felt uh, anxious about coming in and I'm still puzzling over why this issue, why this issue? So, and, and I do think at the risk of bringing in the United States again, um, uh, th there does seem to be a similarity between some of the rhetoric we're hearing down south right now through the election and this. It's been, it feels like it's greatly exaggerated, um, sort of what can, what will fall out from this, what will, and, and we're, we're sort of, um, it feels like a bit of a tempest in a teapot. I don't see the connections that Jordan is making. And as a person who identifies as transgender, it's very, very confusing that this is somehow up for discussion. You saw the tape at the beginning of the program of the, of the, I mean, he tried to give a speech at a university campus and was really quite mercilessly shouted down. And that would be one of the places where Jordan and I would, would have some common ground in that there have, there has been a trend um, in, in, in some ways for people to allow uh, no platforming and this person's views are objectionable and we don't want them to come on the campus. What do you but, think of that? Um, I think, I think it's probably best not discussed in the context of someone's personal identity, right? So that's part of, my, that's part of what I'm, I'm bothered by, by this discussion. So if, you can't have a, if you can't have a discussion about free speech on a university campus, then I guess you can't have one, because that's supposed to be where they happen, isn't I, it? I, I agree with you. I, I, I think that that is a problem. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, those issues came up around um, issues of uh, someone who was pro-Israel who wanted to come onto a campus. Those things are political. My identity 
my, my personal identity, my gender identity, is very separate from my political identity. And so it's very strange to have this to be where we're going to plant the flag and say, enough with this crazy political correctness. You don't get to choose your pronouns. I thought, I thought it it was seems a, trivial to me. I thought it was an axiom, say, of feminism, for example, that the personal was political. I mean, isn't that the... That's a famous well, phrase, the personal is political. Okay. The but personal speak is political when someone is attacking you on a basis that is personal and that you can't change about yourself. That's a, that is political. And that's when people sometimes become politicized, is when they realize that no matter what they do in the world, there will be people who will continue to attack them mm -hmm. on racist grounds, on gender and sexual violence grounds. And that's why people start to fight back. And that's why people object. And your, but attempts, on, and your attempts to regulate my language use and I don't care about your language use. I care about the safety of the people who are being harmed. I know. Pe people who make your kinds of arguments are always concerned with other people's safety. I'm concerned that with my own safety. My, just so that people are aware, my physical, emotional life and livelihood is at risk from being here. And that's not in true of everyone. To mine, say. I don't know about yours because yes, I don't you do. live you know your life. Well I you know perfectly well about I do know that you have tenure letter. and that that's one of the major ways that you're able to do this. Um, but I just want people to be aware that trans and gender, gender diverse communities and especially uh, people of color are being targeted and threatened physically. So free speech is a great idea and equality is a great idea, but we actually can't have those conversations when people are not even able to be present. Jordan, let me read this tweet to you and I'll get you to respond to it because I think it's instructive of the conversation that just took place between the two of you. Uh, can someone please explain to Jordan B. Peterson that there's a difference between freedom of speech and freedom from consequence? Do you agree there's a difference? Well, certainly there's a difference. And are you prepared to suffer the consequences that society may deem you need to suffer because of your views? I'm, yes, I'm prepared to do that. What does so, that entail? Are you open to learning? Well, hang That's on. That's not the question. Hang on, that, that wasn't the question. It's That's true. Right. Well, so what am I willing to do? Well, I think that the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal is probably obligated by their own tangled web to, to bring me in front of it. If they find me, I won't pay it. If they put me in jail, I'll go on a hunger strike. You've I'm not doing this. That's that. Mm -hmm. I'm not using the wor words that other people require me to use, especially if they're made up by radical left-wing ideologues. Now, if our society comes to some sort of consensus over the next while about how we'll solve the pronoun problem, let's call it, and that becomes part of popular parlance and it seems to solve the problem properly without sacrificing the distinction between singular and plural and without requiring me to memorize an impossible list of an indefinite number of pronouns, then I would be willing to reconsider my position. But I'm also partly um, opposed to this because it's been made mandatory and has the whole weight of the law behind it. It's like, this is a very bad idea. I believe this is a very bad idea. And I believe that the reason this has caused so much noise, tremendous amount of noise, tremendous amount of attention on YouTube, is because there are things that, that are at stake in this discussion, despite its surface nature, that's, that, that strike at the very heart of our civilization. That's you, what I believe. Do you have tenure? I, I do. And so, so they can't fire you for this? Well, it's not all that easy to figure out what people can and can't do. If, if I'm, certainly, they could fire me if I was, let's say, uh, um, if, if the hate speech allegation, so to speak, stuck. I mean, the university, look, the university's been quite reasonable about this, especially compared to many universities. Actually, we're going to have a debate. I was just going to say, we've got a minute left, and I do yeah. want to give it okay. to Jordan, because okay. the university has not said entirely, shut up, we don't want to hear this anymore. No, they well, I went and talked to the dean on Friday, and I sat down with my family, and I thought, okay, what would be the best way for this to go for everyone, for me and, and for my students and for the university and for society? I thought, okay, well, really, obviously there's an issue here, several of them, because otherwise all of this noise wouldn't have emerged. So we should actually have a debate about it. And that's happening. Yes, so I went and talked to the dean, David Cameron, who was a very reasonable person, and... I said, look, well, I think the University of Toronto should take a leadership position on this, and there's, there's issues to be discussed here. So who are you debating? Ha, huh, well, that remains to be seen. I haven't seen people flooding out of the woodwork to debate me so far. Do we have far. a date, place, and time yet? Um, we don't. It'll be on the campus. It'll probably be on, in a, on a morning in the next two weeks. Okay. Um, you and let me know. We'll tweet I it out there. I will let you know. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. That's our time, I'm afraid, everybody. I, I do want to thank everybody for coming in tonight, and I hope you found it was worth your while. We certainly found it. Uh, 
I think, a very useful Can exercise. Resources for people. Sorry. People who just watch this program may be really in need of something. Sure. You so, got a website? Yeah. Um, I would really encourage people to go to transformingjustice.ca. It's a current research initiative that will appeal to anyone with any interest in research and learning. Say it again. Transformingjustice.ca. Transforming we are happy to put that out there. Thank you. Theron Meyer, thank the you. trans pundit and YouTuber in Vancouver. Kyle Kirkup, the professor of law at University of Ottawa. We thank both of you for being uh, outside our studio, but part of our broadcast tonight. Jordan Peterson at the U of T, Nick Matt from the U of T, Mary Rogan. You can read more about this in her piece, Growing Up Trans, in the October issue of Walrus Magazine on better bookstore and corner store stands everywhere. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.